Good afternoon. Welcome to Preaching with Power 2024, our annual lecture, and our lecturer today is the Reverend Dr. Judy Fentress Williams. I am grateful for those who are present in the Bimbo Hall, but I realize that there may be more people watching online than are in person. Um, so I'm going to be cognizant of the fact that when I speak that I'm speaking to a broader audience and also knowing that people will watch in the days and weeks ahead of this. To welcome you to the seminary, I invite our president, the Reverend Dr. R. Guy Irwin. Following our president, our dean will come, Dr. J. Eric, I'm messing that up, Dr. Sebastian, how about that? <laughs> but Dr. Sebastian has a special duty today. He will acknowledge two of our students within the black church concentration who have the highest GPA. Let us welcome now our president. Good morning. What a blessing it is to be together on this fine day for all the good things that await us. I'm thrilled that we have Dr. Fentress Williams with us for this year's lecture. It's an exciting thing. I know it will be good. She and I share degrees from Yale. We were there at the same time, in fact. So, good. We did our dissertation, finished our dissertations the same year, although we were in different areas. And uh, she is vastly younger than I am. <laughs> It's great to have you here. Welcome to everyone, the people in the room, the people online, the people yet to come who will view this in days ahead. We're grateful to be able to be here together to celebrate this wonderful day, this great convocation. Thank you, Dr. Robertson, for pulling it together. And congratulations to the award winners you'll be seeing in a minute. But I just want to say welcome. Stay up for a handshake. Yes. That? That's perfect. I promised my boss that I was going to bring him <laughs> something, and then I forgot to leave it up here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. As dean of the seminary, I have to carry out several uh, duties and functions, some of them not very pleasant, but today, Today is a special day because this is one of the most pleasant duties that I have been assigned to carry out. And that's the award of the Reverend J.Q. Jackson, a special merit scholarship. This award was established in honor of the Reverend J.Q. Jackson, who in 1949 was the first, two Af first of two African Americans the other being the Reverend Jeremiah A. Wright Sr. to earn a master's degree, the Master of Sacred Theology from the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia. It is awarded each spring sem semester to two or three African-American students in the Black Church Studies concentration overseen by the Urban Theological Institute who have the highest cumulative GPA who have not yet received the award. And so it's with a great deal of pleasure that I first welcome and invite Cassandra Og Bavier to come on the stage and receive the award. When a brand new student comes to the seminary, they are assigned an advisor. 
and the advisor accompanies the student right through their career. It's with a great deal of pleasure that I want to award the second J.Q. Jackson Merit Scholarship to my advisee, Earl Roberts. Chance to applaud. Come in between. Come in. A little more over. Oh, this way. This way. Want a center? Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay. We didn't rehearse this part. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Congratulations again. Thank you. Now what we have been waiting for. Um, in the back of the program bulletin that you receive, you will see the actual bio of the Reverend Dr. Judy Fentress Williams. I just want to highlight a few things. Uh, Dr. Fentress Williams is bivocational. Uh, she is a professor of Old Testament at Virginia Theological Seminary. And her bio says, Senior Assistant to the Pastor for Teaching and Preaching at the Alfred Street Baptist Church. I gave her a new title the last two days. <laughs> I called her the Senior Associate Minister of the Church. Um, many of us know um, Dr. Howard John Wesley. Uh, he has come to us for our 40th anniversary of the UTI program and has come to preaching with power in the past and uh, been a blessing to the community. So I said this about you, Dr. Judy, because you know, it's Dr. Judy at Alpha Street. I said, have any of you ever been at a church that when the pastor was not there, you wanted to leave, but when you saw which one was going to preach from the associates, you stayed? <laughs> That's who Dr. Judy is at Alpha Street. Now that is not in your bio, that is Dr. Q's a personal opinion, but please forgive me for my bias. I um, do want to highlight three things about Dr. Judy Fentress Williams. She recently published a commentary on the Book of Ruth for the Abington Old Testament Commentary Series. She has been a contributor and Old Testament editor for the CEB Women's Bible, CEB standing for Common English Bible, and her book entitled Holy Imagination a Literary Guide to the Bible was published in March 2021. She is a member of the Society for Biblical Literature and serves on the advisory board for religious life at Princeton University. She is married to Dr. Kevin Williams, uh, that's medical doctor. I don't know if this ever happened to you when they call you Dr. Judy, people come to you and ask you for medical advice and you say, no, you gotta talk to my husband, I can't help you. And they are the proud parents of Samantha and Jacob. ULS, will you welcome with me the Reverend Dr. Judy Fentress Williams. Good afternoon. It's my joy and my honor to be with you all this morning. And I want to extend my thanks to Dr. Quentin Robertson, to your president, Dr. Irwin, and your dean, Dr. Sebastian. Thank you for your welcome. Thank you for your hospitality. As a Bible scholar who is passionate about sound and effective preaching, I'm really glad to be with you at this Preaching with Power conference. I'm glad to know there is a time set aside to think about this most critical vocation of the proclamation of God's word. The title of my lecture is The Iconographic Commission. If it had a subtitle, it would be something like Good News in a Bad Space. I want to draw your attention first to Jeremiah. 
in that first chapter of Jeremiah, we encounter what we would call an iconic call narrative of the one known as the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. Remember the Lord's call to Jeremiah and how poetic it is. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, if you remember that part, you know what comes next, because then Jeremiah says, oh, you got the wrong man. Jeremiah says, ah, oh, Lord God, I truly do not know how to speak, for I'm only a boy. Poor Jeremiah. Jeremiah's response reveals that he doesn't know what we know, that his call, in fact, is modeled after Moses' call that he's being set up to be a prophet like Moses. And that this whole pushback thing, this whole argue against the call, this whole reason your way out of the call is a waste of time. <laughs> Moses would say, man, God always wins. If you're a sci-fi fan and the language of the Borg, resistance to the call is futile. <laughs> Or if you like music, your arms are too short to box with God. If God commissions you, eventually you will end up going where you were sent and speak what God commands. Jeremiah's call narrative, the, this story of his commission, is iconic not only because of the way that it's modeled after Moses, but because of the way the book of Jeremiah lets us look into the prophet's interior life. We get to think a little bit about what it feels to do this work that God has called us to do. And I want to draw your attention to the fact, not that Jeremiah protests, but his excuse, I am only a boy. That's learned behavior. Jeremiah is protesting because at some point he learned that his age was an issue. And it is from that perspective that that learned behavior makes sense. Or perhaps he never saw a prophet his age. And so he mistakenly concluded there was something wrong with his commission because he'd never seen anybody who looked like him. He could only imagine based on what he had seen. And there was a disconnect between the assignment and his context. There was a disconnect between the, the assignment and his embodiment. And I want us to consider the gap between our assignment, our commission, and our embodiment, the way we show up in the world, the way we are perceived, the way we are signified. From the time we come into this world, people are putting words over us. Oh, she looks just like her daddy. Oh, he's not the brightest one in the family. Oh, we get spoken over us our entire lives. We are signified. And what happens when those things aren't aligned with what we are called to do? Yeah. What happens when we wake up one day and find ourselves in a situation where we're called to something that is in no way amenable to our being? What happens when we feel that we're called into a room where it is hard to breathe? How do we navigate the call to preach and proclaim the good news in a hostile space? So these questions matter greatly to me because all preaching is embodied preaching, right? Preaching with power requires a particular kind of embodiment. And I would argue it begins with an embodied preacher that is engaging an embodied text. All right, so we've got an embodied preacher, an embodied text in a community that belongs to a particular context. So you've got three levels of embodiment, wherever you're coming from, where the text is coming from, and where your people are coming from, all right? No one enters this world as a blank slate. 
And we cannot escape our context. You can't escape your history. You can't escape your past. You can't escape your language. You cannot escape this here flesh. And the ongoing challenge for preachers is how does my embodiment engage with an embodied truth in the text in the way that people can receive it? All right? So this text that we're talking about, in this case, the Bible, is life-giving in my mind only when we can engage it in its embodied sense, in this embodied dialogue where we navigate the language, the history, the worldview, the culture, the theology, the genre, and the characteristics of Bible. And do that for a people who are called to belong to certain contexts and systems and cultures and laws and languages that shape what they are actually able to hear. You all have had this experience of preaching a sermon and someone comes and tells you what they got and that had absolutely <laughs> nothing to do with what you were saying, right? But what they were able to hear got them to that point, all right? So we always have to be mindful of what limitations our audience brings and how that interacts with our own limitations. This preaching thing is hard work. Oh, yeah. Amen. <laughs> so my approach to Bible begins with a womanist hermeneutic. This is my embodiment. I am a woman of color, always have been. That's not something I opted into. And a womanist hermeneutic sits at the intersection of gender, race, and class. Hear this, it is an embodied hermeneutic. None of us should be asked to check our embodiment at the door when we enter into sacred space, all right? Bring all of who you are into the space, all right? And so that's important to me to have that embodied hermeneutic. My methodology is a literary approach, which is dialogic. Dialogic criticism argues that the Bible is a text in dialogue. There are many voices in the text. Y'all know, y'all are in seminary. You know all the J, E, P, and D. Well, J is in conversation with P, and J and E always seem to be having something going on, and D thinks that D knows more than all the rest of them. And so there's this way in which the text is constantly in conversation. And so one of the things I'm hoping is happening is that when I have a difficult text, I hope and hope and hope that there's more to the conversation that I haven't heard. All right, and I want to encourage you, do not set up a dialogue that is simply Old Testament versus New. That is not life-giving. There's a lot of conversation going on between John and all the rest of them, right? There's a conversation going on between Paul and Jesus. So be mindful of all the levels of dialogue between writers and between characters in the text. Dialogic criticism argues that the truth comes out of the conversation. A dialogic approach would say that you need more than one consciousness in order to hold on to the truth. I love this, this is freeing. You no longer are responsible to know all the truth because your mind couldn't handle it if you wanted, all right? Truth is bigger than a single mind. The truth is embodied truth, all right? It's not out there, it's in here, all right? The truth, according to dialogic criticism, focuses on event rather than system. So it's not an outside structure so much as it is event. And in the Bible, more often than not, that is encounter. And finally, the truth of the Bible is never finished. In dialogic criticism, this is called unfinalizability. It's why we keep coming back, because there is a surplus of meaning in the Bible. Yes. And that is good news. So we want to bring these embodied ways of gauging the text, our embodied perspective, and I want you to bring your embodiment to the text, um, and then use this tool to see what embodied truth we can find in the text. I want to spend a few minutes looking at the story of Hagar in Genesis chapter 16. And I want to share just a couple of verses with you. Chapter 16, verses 7 to 14. Thank you. 
for putting that out. That's great. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am running away from my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. Let's just take that in. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild horse of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he will live at odds with his kin. So she named the Lord who spoke to her, you are Elroy, for she said, have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore, the well was called Ber Laharoi. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. So I came in in the middle of the story because I know you all know this story. This is the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. God makes a promise to Abram in chapter 12. Back then his name was Abram in chapter 12 and says, you're going to be a great nation and you're going to be blessed and you're going to be a blessing and I'm going to give you this land. So he makes, and you're going to have many, 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 many descendants. This is the promise God makes. We call it the threefold promise. Abraham's here, he's like, I'm here for it. He goes because God tells him to go. And they are struggling with infertility. So this whole great nation thing is a problem from the very beginning. Hold in your mind the moment that comes when you recognize that there is something between where you are, your own embodiment, and what God has called you to. That sometimes your embodiment itself seems to be the threat to the promise of God. Think about that, all right? This is the space where Abram and Sarai live. And in this particular context, in this particular story, it's Sarah's fault, all right? Sarah has a lot of pressure on her at this moment. And if you look in the history of criticism and go back to the Old Testament library, one of my favorite old commentaries by Gerhard von Rod, he talks about the tension in the family, right? So in chapter 16, Sarai decides to give her handmaid to Abram mm -hmm. so that she can have a child. And if, if Hagar has a child, the child would be Sarah's child, right? This is Sarah's way of saving face and having some status, some relative life in this world. And so Abram says, I'm down with that. And so Hagar conceives, and then something happens between Sarah and Hagar. You all know the story. And Sarah goes back to Abram, and the next thing we know, Hagar is out in the wilderness, right? Gerhard von Rad, in talking about this situation, says, poor Abram, caught between these two squabbling women. That's what he says. It's in there, I promise you. Because of the commentator's embodiment, he identifies with Abram. Right, then you move up to the 70s and all the women who are feminists, they're like, well, what about Sarah? Right, poor Sarah. She lives in a culture where her value is connected to her ability not only to produce a child, but a male child. That's a lot, right? She has no value other than her ability to make baby boys. And when we reduce people to production, what happens, right? Then we get Dolores Williams like, hold up, wait a minute. Let's talk about Hagar, and let's talk about what it means to be a woman whose body is used to further the well-being of the people who own her. And let's talk about how that's connected to what happened in this country, in our own history of slavery. So we get interpretations that are shaped by the embodiment 
of the interpreters. We should never get mad at somebody for taking Abram's side. We just need to recognize that that's who they are identifying with, that that's where their embodiment brings them, which is why we always need to have more than one voice at the table, Amen. right? We need multiple voices. So in this biblical story, the biblical narrator, like a good preacher, is telling us a good story. The Hebrew narrative isn't, not, isn't that wordy, but it's a good story, right? It's filled with intrigue, and even the gaps cause us to wonder what's going on. Let's take a moment and think about Hagar's character. And her characterization in the text is her embodiment. The only thing we know about her are the descriptions that the narrator gives her. So this characterization is the way that flesh is put on bones. It doesn't tell us a lot but it tells us enough. Starts off by telling us her name, her gender, her status, and her nationality. But it doesn't do it in that order. It says Sarah had a handmaid. So she's introduced as belonging to Sarah. Sarah had an Egyptian handmaid, a slave girl whose name was Hagar. She belongs to Sarah. She's an Egyptian. So the text here is telling us so much because in a story from a people who are obsessed with their identity, we know everything we need to know about this woman from the way she is introduced. In narrative language, Hagar is wrong in the way she shows up. Um, let's see if I, so in, um, um, okay, just give me 30 seconds to talk comic book. In a comic book, do you have a hero and you have an anti-hero? Sometimes what makes a character an anti-hero is their embodiment. They don't look the right way. They don't come from the right neighborhood. They're not beautiful, all right? They're somehow flawed. And in this sense, Hagar's embodiment is wrong, okay? She's wrong for the part of hero. She is a sister outsider a servant of Sarah. And as a servant of Sarah, there are certain legalities that apply to her. Now this is what's interesting. Because she belongs to Sarah, she doesn't belong to Abraham. Now think about that. Abraham is the head of the entire household, which means he has access to any woman in his household which is why the Bible says things like, don't sleep with your daughter or your brother's wife, because as the head of the household, the man had access to any woman in the household. We call that rape culture, okay? But because she was Sarah's servant, he didn't have access to her. It means something that Sarah offers Hagar up. She's set apart, but she still does not get to make decisions over her own life. So the question is, does Sarah offer up Hagar because she's desperate or because she thinks that inevitably Abram's gonna ask for her anyway? We don't know what motivates her. There's this gap. We don't understand the motivation. All we know is that she makes this offer and he accepts. And in so doing, she gets a different status. So we look at other ancient Near Eastern laws, the Code of Hammurabi, the Nuzi text, and what they tell us is that when a woman in Hagar's situation is taken on as a wife, some kind of concubine. She has an elevated status over servant, but not too high. She's got to stay right here in this zone, a little bit higher, but not too high. Less slave, but not free. And somehow, Hagar doesn't stay in that box. And this is where the problem starts. Now, this is the part that intrigues me, because after she conceives, something happens. Something without words transpires. And it has to do with a look. And I don't know whether, you know, I'm a, I'm a black woman, I'm thinking she looked out the side of her eye. But it could be 
that she looked through her. Whatever she did, it set Sarah off, right? It added insult to injury after injury after injury after injury. So when she goes to Abram and complains about Hagar, and Hagar says, your maid is in your hands, he is essentially transferring ownership back to her. All right? So Sarah and Hagar, I'm sorry, Sarah and Abram are working out their thing, passing this woman back and forth because nobody wants to deal with the complexities of the problem that they created for themselves. All right? And Hagar decides she's been passed one time too many. And so she goes out into the wilderness. Now, what Hagar doesn't know is that the wilderness is where you meet God. So you may be running away from one situation, but only God knows what's going to happen when you encounter the angel of the Lord. And she has this encounter, and this is such an amazing story, because it says, the angel of the Lord found her. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? Have you ever noticed how sometimes God shows up or an angel shows up and asks a question they already know, right? Like, um, Adam, where are you, right? Uh, Cain, where's your brother? Um, You already know. And so this is not a question that is trying to get information. It's an invitation. And Hagar does the right thing. She says, let me tell you where I'm going. She just tells the story, right? She says, I took... I took a look around at my situation and decided I needed to get out. And I believe that what follows next is a commission. So stay with me. First, the angel says, return to your mistress and submit to her. Um, I don't like that part. So we're going we're to come back to that in a minute. Uh, um, I'm avoiding. Return, so that's the first thing the angel of the Lord says to her, right? Then we get the same words again. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And then we get another time. The angel of the Lord said to her, now you, shall con- you have conceived and shall bear a son and you shall call him Ishmael. This is a difficult text. And when you encounter a difficult text, what I say to my students over and over again is don't run away. All right? Don't decide you're done with God. You know, so many times I've heard people say, well, if this is the kind of God, we've got this whole little routine. Stay in the story. All right? So when we encounter a difficult text, because it's a dialogic text, one of the questions we will ask is, what else does the text say? So the text does say, return to your mistress and submit. I can't take that out. If I had voting rights, I would. But let's look at the second and third things first, all right? Because the angel says three times, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. In verse 10, the angel says, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. So here we have what looks to be an iteration of the promise that was given to Abram. But this one comes directly to Sarah. It's not given through anyone else. God says, I will multiply your descendants so that they cannot be counted for multitude. That's a win, right? In a culture that's obsessed with procreation because it's tied to to survival, Hagar knows that she is going to be the mother of a people that will be a great people. Yay, Hagar, that's a win, all right? Look at the next one. You have conceived and will bear a son, and you shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. Let's pause there for a moment. Ishmael, that E-L is what we call a theophoric element, which means God is in Ishmael's name, all right? 
And the first part is hear. God will hear. God hears. What a beautiful name for a woman who is subject to this oppression. Ishmael, that is his name. For the Lord has listened to your affliction. Now let's spend a minute with verse 12. He will be a wild ass of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall live at odds with all his kin. So here's a moment where we really want to spend some time doing a word study. Because the word that gets interpreted as wild ass, parade, should really be wild horse or zebra. Okay? Zebras are not domesticated. Zebras are not bred to be ridden. What you say? Zebras are animals that are free. And they stay in the wilderness because that is where they can be free. There's something about this promise over Ishmael that is about freedom and openness. However, we get this, see, this is the thing about the Bible I love. You get this powerful word about Ishmael, even as it's being communicated to us through a people who will eventually see this man who is a relative as an enemy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Genesis 101, everybody who is your enemy is your cousin. <laughs> You're all related. And so the only way to make an other is to tell a narrative that justifies why I'm making you others so I can treat you badly. We do, this all the, we do this all the time. The stories we tell about who's on our side and who isn't. I'm still working on Ishmael. I want you to know there's a lot here. But just know that wild ass is not the only way, nor is it necessarily the ideal way to translate that. If we need to understand wild as an animal that is not meant to be tamed, like however you want to think of that, I want you to think of someone who is not to be tamed, coming from a mother who was enslaved. Yes, yes. Right? There's something there. And in all honesty, if you come from a mother who was enslaved and you go a little bit far over there, I'm not mad at you. That's a pendulum. All right? So hold that. So the second promise, you're going to be a great nation. Yay. You're going to have a son who is free. Yeah. OK. All right. And then we've got to figure out whether um, this part about living at odds with all his kin, everyone's hand against him, that, that also can be softened. All right. It really could be something about living alongside. So we've got to, we want to tease that out a little bit more. My point is, the promises in verse, verses 10 and 11, that was pretty good. But we can't get to 10 and 11 without going through 9. That's good. That's not so now we got to go back to verse 9, which is where I don't want to go. But we have to go back. So the problem with verse 9 for me is that as a womanist, I'm, I'm all about a God of liberation. I'm looking for a God who makes a way in the sea, a God who breaks the chains of the enslaved. And here we have God saying, go back. And it's an imperative. It's not a suggestion. It's not, think about going back. It says, no, you, you, right? Second person, feminine singular. You go back. Go back to slavery. Go back to dysfunction. Go back to Sarai and all her issues. Go back to Abram and all of his issues. So here I say that when we have a difficult text, one thing to do is to look at the other text. When you have a difficult text, you want to do a word study. So I want to look at this word, submit. It's not good news. <laughs> Spoiler alert. I know. I wish I could have gotten you out. So this word to submit, anah, in this text is in the hit pile. 
The hit by hell is a Hebrew stem that is intensive and reflexive. So this is go back and submit. It is intentional submission. It is self-motivated submission. It is repetitive. So I know, it doesn't get better. Repetitive <laughs> submission. It's this go back and submit and submit and submit and submit. Some of us come to this point in the story and decide, this is not acceptable, I'm out. <laughs> right? This is the part where people say, this is the kind of God, and then we do this little song and dance about how the God in the Old Testament is so angry and the God in the New Testament is all love. That is not true. That's not going to get you out. All right? So I want you to resist the urge to walk away. I want you to resist the urge to reason your way out and to talk about this ancient culture and how it doesn't have impact on your life. I want to invite you to resist the urge to look away and invite you instead, as you would look at an icon, to look through. Don't look away. Don't walk away. Look through. Hagar's story, Hagar's character, if you will, functions like an icon. It is something we look through to see something else. Stay with me here. The story of Hagar is a story that is showing up for somebody who is holding space. Think about the ministry of holding space. Hagar goes back into a difficult situation and literally carries the future inside of her. Mm. Talk about but she talk. is in a difficult space. From a, prof from a prophetic perspective, I think we could think of Hagar as a sign act. Think about how God says to Jeremiah, go do this thing, and this thing you're doing represents this other thing. Yes. I think there's something about Hagar's embodiment in this text that is a sign act. She carries, she has an assignment to hold space in this family to which her son has a right. He is the firstborn of Abraham. He is born in Abraham's household. And Abraham names him. I always love this part because the angel says his name shall be Ishmael. And then the Bible says Hagar had a son. And Abram says his name is Ishmael. How did Abram know that? He went in the tent and Hagar said his name is Ishmael. And he came out of the tent and said his name is Ishmael. You know how this happens. But the point is, in that household, he is established as the firstborn of Abram. And he is Abram's son. Hagar's embodiment is evidence of a promise. Her survival is evidence of a promise. Now, I'm going to be honest with you and say I pray to God. God never calls me to this kind of work. I pray that this is never my commission. But I suspect that everyone in this room will have a moment where you are called to occupy difficult space. And it may be just because of the way you show up in a room. Go into that space. And sometimes submission means being constrained. Right? Sometimes submission means being judged by people who know nothing about you. Being questioned because clearly you can't know everything that I know. Or you may be called to serve a congregation that's looking at you out of the side of their eyes all day and all night. <laughs> called, commissioned to difficult space. Yeah. This is Women's History Month. We just got out of Black History Month. All right? The point I want to make here is that we could call the role of names of people 
who existed in tight spaces just to hold space for us. Do not ever think that when you enjoy rights and privileges in any place where you didn't always have rights and privileges that it happened overnight. Somebody stood and held space and was constrained, but stayed there because of the promise they had for us. This is a commission. This is a calling. I want us, I want to make sure that you do not mistake me for saying that we should want or gravitate towards or desire to be in places that don't acknowledge our full humanity. That's not what I'm saying, nor do I think that is God's will for anybody's life, right? That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that liberation sometimes takes time. That sometimes liberation is hard work. And I am worried and I pray to God I'm wrong that in this country, in the United States of America, we will feel, and if you haven't felt it yet, you will feel it, that we are going back and not forward. That we're moving away from liberation. What does it mean to proclaim the good news in a difficult space, in a nation that no longer believes that your embodiment is okay, that you have the same rights as others. We need to remember Mother Hagar. We need to look at her in her eyes. We need to hold that story, and we need to look through her because liberation sometimes is a long time coming. One of my favorite um, things to do in a class is to teach the Exodus story and then look at movies on the Exodus. You know, Cecil B. DeMille, Ten Commandments, um, Prince of Egypt by DreamWorks. I've got a collection of them. I love these movies. With the exception of one, All of these movies portray the crossing of the Red Sea in a particular way, right? Moses walks out, whoosh, right, whoosh, right? It's a beautiful thing, right? And everybody goes, oh, and then they cross over and they walk on dry land and then it goes downhill. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that's not in the Bible. The Bible says that a strong wind blew all night. Moses held his arm out over the water all night. While the children of slaves were sleeping, Moses held space by keeping watch and fulfilling the commandment that God gave him. And that may be what we are called to do in the days ahead. All right? I'm going to stop there. Thank you. They said, no, no, I'm stopping there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. That's yeah, that's that's it. No questions? He's got to wash over us. That's right, I'm good. And congratulations. Thank you so much.
I'm still wrestling. I guess my question to you is what advice do you have for people who find themselves in the position where they have to hold space in a difficult? So I think even with you bringing up Moses, holding up his hand all night, and even Hagar, the text doesn't really tell us what they're doing internally in that moment. Yeah. So what advice or yeah. just yeah. inferences you can make from the text yeah. that can be helpful for those that find yeah. themselves in that particular so, Yeah, so thank you for that. This is a great question. I, again, I want to be really clear. I am not putting this forward as anything that anyone should ever want to do or stay, but that there might be times when we find ourselves in that space. So what we know about Hagar, remember, she's, um, she gets kicked out again. And, um, and in the second time in chapter 21, um, they stay out at Ber Laharoi. Um, remember when Abraham's servant brings Rebecca back for Isaac, the Bible tells us Isaac had just come from Ber Laharoi. I believe in my heart that Ishmael and Isaac had a relationship. In spite of all the foolishness that was going on with their mothers, that this, for Isaac, Ishmael was his big brother. And I think that Hagar functioned as, if this is a kind of, you know, with families where there are multiple wives, the mothers mother all the children. And so I think there is some hope and promise there. And Hagar doesn't stay there forever. She stays there long enough. Um, she stays there until Ishmael turns one. Um, so that was another, you know, that was, that was some time. Um, but I think the first thing to remember is hopefully you won't be there forever. Um, and I think in situations like that, it's really important to check in with God on a very regular basis. No, seriously, and be like, am I still supposed to be here? And if so, what am I supposed to do today? And the other thing I would do is ask God to show you. Lord, show me who are the people I'm holding space for. Like, give me a sense of what I'm doing in this space to, to make that. And, and I, I would be unashamedly asking for a way out. OK? Yeah. 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 This is something I'm curious about, especially for biblical scholars. Mm -hmm and especially for ones who do what you just did, which is to look at the text and not run from the difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, in your own journey, how do you not say, okay, that's it? I mean, once you acknowledge this is a mess, yeah. say something about yeah. your own journey around yeah. becoming a biblical scholar and how you stay yeah. in community of faith and how you continue to preach and do the things that are that take the Bible seriously, devotionally, et cetera. Thank you, Dr. Callahan. Um, I, so before I became a Bible scholar, I, I grew up in a home that took the Bible seriously. I went to Christian school, um, which was problematic, but I went to Christian school. I think what I'm trying to say is at some point in my own faith life, I understood in some fundamental way that God had been faithful. So this is what this sense of embodied truth. I didn't understand everything in the Bible. I didn't understand why people suffered like they did. Um, still don't. But I also have experienced God's faithfulness in ways that, that keep me. And so then once I started studying Bible and learning critical methods, it was important for me to find one that didn't dismiss the text. So. So I do, like, you know, I teach my students all the things. I teach them, you know, the historical critical method. We do all these things. But when you get to canonical criticism, um, canonical criticism is a turning point because it talks about the Bible in its final form. And the argument here is that it comes from all these different places. Yes, it does. We don't have an original text. We sure don't. It was oral before it was written. Amen. All of that is true. And it comes from a people who have an agenda because we all have agendas, say that, right? This is all true. It is also true that the canonization process and coming together, I believe something happens to those individual pieces that make it more than the sum of its parts. So the analogy I use is that I can make a cake from all these different ingredients, but when it comes out of the oven, I can't get my eggs back. 
So there's something that happens when Genesis 1 is in front of Genesis 2. I hope it's the Holy Spirit that does something in that text um, to open the way for life. So I just keep looking until I find something that's life-giving. Yeah. And usually it's worth the effort. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. That was, uh, that was rich. Yeah. And I, I think okay. I find myself wondering um, about, and, and I'm speaking in, in an embodied way, but like who's holding the space? Like as you were, as you were speaking, I was thinking, this, this is great, but why does it have to be a black woman in the space, right? Ooh, I, ooh, don't and, I, and, I don't and, know. But then, you, but then, but then you, mentioned, you mentioned Moses. Yeah. And I was like, okay. Yeah. But I do wonder who's holding the space, how gendered, or even how, how are we question. talking about marginalized identities? Like, who's really holding the space? <sighs> that is a great I, question. I don't know if I have an answer. I mean, but if you think historically and culturally, it is, it feels like a lot of it is, looks, like, looks like us. Yes. But I think it's important when we find examples of other people holding space to name it. Because I think there's reality and the narratives around reality that set up expectations. And so whenever I find someone who doesn't look like me holding space, I want to make sure that's a part of the story um, so that it isn't, so that we're not then in its kind of self-perpetuating narrative. Right. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yes, sir. How do you know when you're holding that space? Yes, how do you identify? How, how do you know? Yes. When it feels really bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when you feel constrained, when you feel like you cannot be yourself. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So, so, Dr. Judy, they really appreciate you. Um, I usually get up and say, can we celebrate? And I couldn't even get to the mic, and y'all gave her a standing ovation. So, wow, thank you. Um, I just want to make a brief announcement and then talk about um, why you received envelopes um, and then ask um, Dr. Croft to dismiss us. But let me just say... Um, Riggins Earl at ITC was my ethics professor. And so those who don't know ITC, Interdenominational Theological Center, is a historically black seminary. And um, so a lot of us were black in the seminary, we were students. And R Riggins would call us Hagar's children, Hagar's children. And I didn't like it. I'm like, why are you calling me Hagar's child? But today. <laughs> I'm proud to be Hagar's child. Thank you. You gave us new meaning. In, in other words, you can't tame me. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm, I'm a, well, I ain't going to say that. I'm, <laughs> I do want to just make these few acknowledgments um, that I usually do before the lecture because I was so excited that Dr. Judy was speaking. I didn't do it before. You know, I wanted to give her time. Um, but um, we have some alumni here. And one of the alumni I want to point out is the Bishop of the Southeast Senate of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America not just uh, alumnus of United Lutheran Seminary, but also of the Urban Theological Institute of United Lutheran Seminary. I just received word that this is Bishop's last, this your last year, Bishop, as Bishop? Can you stand so we can celebrate you, Bishop? This is Bishop Patricia Davenport.
her office is upstairs if you need to see her. But with that said, um, I see the chair, and they, I don't know why these two power brokers are sitting in the back rows, but I see the chair of Utica. Utica is the Urban Theological Institute Committee of Advisors. Our chair is here, Dr. Kevin Johnson. Please stand first and then stay standing. All the members of Utica and former members of Utica, even faculty members of Utica, please stand so we can acknowledge you. Thank you, thank you. And I know we're on campus, but I'm gonna just do it anyway. All faculty, students, and staff, please stand, <laughs> which is a lot of you. <laughs> so in reference to the envelope, um, and there is a QR code, I, I mentioned this on Sunday night that I had these like envelopes created prior to the pandemic and we really weren't into QR codes a few years ago. And so whenever I can get rid of these envelopes, I'm saying put some in them so I get new envelopes. And I go back to Linda Fiore Communications and say I need new envelopes. She'll put a QR code on the envelope. Oh, you're so sweet. But I don't want to waste the ones I have. But if you do want to give online, it does show you can just scan your phone to the QR code. It'll take you to our website. It'll tell you where to go. You can... Um, and this is especially for those who are watching online. But if you do feel inclined to give a gift that supports our students in our JQ Jackson Scholarship Fund, um, please do so. Um, use the envelope of our students. And students who are, I don't know, I want to call you all host. The host students that are working today, would you stand? So I want to celebrate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. They will have baskets if you just want to place that in there when you leave out. Um, I said this on last night when I was at Grace, um, that I do really push for a JQ Jackson scholarship, but I always know that there are entities that have a particular fund they like. And so when I look at Grace Baptist Church sitting here on this front row right here, and I know that there's this fund named the Jeremiah A. Wright Endowed Chair, they may take the envelope and just scratch J.Q. Jackson and write your, that's all right. We will put it where you want it to be put. So thank you so much. Um, tonight, Reformation re meets Reformation. The pastor of Reformation Lutheran Church in Washington, D.C., which I like to call the Basilica of the Lutheran Church, since it's right across from the Capitol, um, the Reverend Dr. Ke Kevin Van Diver, so we're staying in D.C. area. Y'all noticed that today is the D.C. day? Yeah. Uh, we'll be preaching at Reformation Church Lutheran uh, in Philadelphia. And um, so I invite you tonight at 7 p.m. Tomorrow we'll meet back in the chapel. Reverend Carolyn Cavanis, uh, Pastor Bethel AME Church in Armour, who's also, and I'm going to ask Dr. Woodard to help me. She is the president, moderator. What is she? See, that is too much for me to remember. Just know she's somebody. Uh, and then we will end on tomorrow evening at uh, Dare to Imagine Church, where the Reverend Dr. Kevin Johnson serves as pastor. The preacher of the hour will be the Reverend Willie Dwayne Francois, who recently wrote a book, um, Salicine White Noise. Yeah, you might want to look into that book. It's, it's a good read. Um, so I invite you to come there. There's a table there in the back. If you want information about our school or you know someone who's thinking about seminary, they may want to consider this. Um, I do want to embarrass just one faculty person. Dr. Judy, if you just turn just a little bit, I want you to look at Teresa Smallwood. That's our womanist scholar here on our campus. <laughs> womanist scholar to womanist scholar. <laughs> With that said, would you please, uh, Help me in celebrating the Reverend Wayne Croft, the Jeremiah A. Wright Professor of Homiletics and Liturgics in African American Studies here at the seminary, who will close us in prayer and we can all greet one another. Dr. Croft. Dr. Judy, thank you so much. You have blessed our souls. Why don't we stand? God, we thank you for what our ears have heard, for what our hearts have felt, and for what our eyes have seen. Thank you for this powerful lecturer and lecturer. We pray, God, Lord, that we will go and be witnesses and disciples of what we have heard, God, 
and what you have called us to do. We pray, God, Lord, and thank you for the prophets and prophetess who have held spaces for us. And we pray, God, Lord, that you give us the strength to persevere. Now bless us as we go in peace. In Christ's name, amen. amen.